Hello, lovely humans. I'm Wyo Lee, and you are listening to Sex Stories, a podcast where lovely lovers come on to share stories about come ons and comings, all in an effort to make the world a sexier place. Today's guest has so much in common with me and is also a great contrast to me in so many different ways. They too have educated themselves about sex through art. They are kinky, non-monogamous, and queer. They're passionate about going beyond abstinence-only education. And the specifics of a lot of our pleasures and communication styles are somehow totally different. So this is a great way to wrap up season two of Sex Stories. That's right. This is the season two finale, which means that we have made it through two bouts of 69 episodes apiece. Sex Stories will be on a break for the next month. We'll be back October 22nd. But for the next few weeks, I will be dropping new episodes of our new podcast, Sex at Work, which is launching this Monday, September 20th. So go find that and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Sex at Work is going to be a series of conversations with people who make sex-related livings. And if you lovely listeners choose to participate, there will be sprinkles of bonus mini episodes about whatever hot, hot work encounters you have had, should you choose to share those with me. If you want to contribute, email me a sexy work story, wyo at sexstoriespodcast.com. As always, please keep all sexy thoughts about me and our lovers to yourself and enjoy. Our guest today is a 28-year-old queer, white, gender-fluid sex, kink, and poly advocate, formerly a consumer psychologist who worked for Colgate. They're a bratty bottom who likes to pretend to be a top. She's polyamorous in their first monogamous relationship, into spanking, being wrestled, and shower sex. Originally from Quebec, she now lives in Portland, Oregon. Welcome, Sam. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited for this conversation. Me too. I have so many questions to ask you, but I would like to start with today. If you had to rate yourself on a sexual shameometer, with one being shameless and 10 being super full of shame, where do you fall today? I think I'm on a solid three, I would say. You know, I don't think I'm ever going to be at a 100% shameless. That's just not my personality. I'm kind of like a nervous <laughs> human get being it. to begin with. But yeah, no, I think I've come a long way. Definitely have moments where like I dip into this. If you want a really quick little example of yeah. I just received this really fun BDSM game. It's called Punishment, and it's like a card game where you get prompts. It was super fun. So my partner and I have started doing Punishment Fridays where we just play oh the Punishment God. game. A shout out to Punishment, I guess. Like, yeah. Oh, this isn't meant to be an ad, but, you know. But one of the cards I got this past week was like fake an orgasm just like out of context for your partner and I was just like nope I can't do this like normally I feel pretty good about it and I just got so embarrassed you know that like cheek burning yes. feeling yeah I was like oh my god you're expecting me to perform in this way I can't do mm -hmm. it immediately I was like full of shame in a way that I hadn't felt in quite a while so that's why I put myself at a nice three I think there are certain things where I'm just like nope that is not for me <laughs> I absolutely relate to that I feel like I in the similar context would be like oh, ah now 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 I'm thinking about it now I've thought about it too much but if I was like in a room of tons of people and we were all faking orgasms I might be able to you know like that's good context can you give us a little overview of what your sex life is like right now it's kind of hard to say because I guess this goes back into your intro is like I'm in my first pretty monogamous relationship in the sense that I've always pretty much had other partners besides my primary. And right now, my primary nesting partner is also my exclusive sexual partner. A lot of the reason why that happened was because of COVID. It just didn't okay. feel like we were safe to do that. But also, you know, I don't want to like disclose too much about her, but is really activated around like cheating and things that happened in her past. Mm -hmm. So the idea of me continuing to have multiple like sexual partners is something that she's just not uncomfortable with. So we're working through that in therapy. And as a compromise, we sort of like agreed to be sexually exclusive for the time being. Okay. But that means that she is like my only source of sex. And her and I have really big differences in terms of our preferences and how frequently we yeah. like to have sex. So it's definitely been this huge learning experience. I think in the past, you know, my learning has been how to juggle multiple sexual partners. And now it's like learning how to really find that deep satisfaction with one person yeah. um, and with myself included. Because I do have to say that masturbation has become a really key part of my sexual life as a result of just having one partner. 
Okay. Okay. And not that orgasm is the primary goal in particular, but I do like to know, like, how often, like, do you like to get yourself off every day if you're masturbating? Or, like, what's your frequency kind of like there? Definitely. I find that, you know, just the, like, endorphin release is really good for me. And I find that when I haven't masturbated for a while, I just get, like, more irritable. And I think that irritability often is channeled towards my partner in a way that I hadn't necessarily realized until more recently, where I'm like, oh, well, if you're my primary sex partner, then I expect you to get me off frequently Mm. enough. And so it has become this like really big mindset switch of like, okay, no, Sam, you take care of your needs. And then you can like supplement your needs with partnered sex, but it shouldn't be the other way around. Because again, if I only have one partner, that's putting a lot of expectations on her to like constantly be there and constantly be on. And I don't think that's fair. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. Okay, so next, will you just tell us, what's your definition of sexy? This also comes from my punishment realization. I understood, like, seductive is not my vibe. Like, I feel sexy. I feel like I am playful. And that's probably more of my definition than seductive. And I think that really, like, feels more authentic to how I like to engage with other people. Like, I see sex as very much, like, a game to play together and I see kink in the same way it's kind of like what you were saying there's like rules that you can follow and you can design this space where you get to be silly where you get to explore all these feelings and it's sure sometimes sex is like way more serious but at least for me like I feel way more at ease and relaxed when there is kind of like an undercurrent of fun so I would definitely say that sexy for me is playful and joyful and cute also rather than totally. serious and smoldering and sexual which yeah. I cannot get behind totally totally I do feel like it's like that okay perform now and I'm like I'm a different person <laughs> am I doing it you know okay so here's another question what happens to your sexual shame meter when it comes time to talk to partners about safer sex and how in your perfect world does that conversation go so I'm a sex educator, so I think there's a nice expectation that people have. Like when I start talking about safer sex, nobody is taken by surprise. <laughs> like usually, you know, especially when I was dating a lot more casually, our conversation would be like, hey, what's your name? What do you do? I'm a sex educator. <laughs> so then I've kind of already opened up the door for that conversation to happen later on, especially if we're going to hook up. I do find that, especially in the past, I would ask people for like, STI results. It's not that I don't trust people, but I don't trust people. Like I want to believe that people have gotten tested as frequently as they say they have. And I just don't think that that's actually true when it comes down to it. Most people are like, oh yeah, I just got tested. And people feel then really, really uncomfortable sharing those results. And I do it from a non-shaming way, right? Like my I think my bar is always like, if you have an STI, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Like I don't have a problem with it, but we do need to know and we need to know what that status is. And so my expectation is always to like try to create a safe place where people feel comfortable disclosing whatever status they have. And I think that the like standard for a lot of people feels really uncomfortable when they are being asked to like defend themselves. It almost seems like it's being taken as an attack. Mm. So I think in more recent years, what I've done rather than asking for like proof, it feels a little iffy. What I've done instead is just use barriers. And I think what's really cool is that now we have better barrier options. So I don't know if you've seen, but like Laurel. Yes, my laurels.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I haven't had sex with a person with a vagina since I learned about laurels, but it's, I'm hoping soon because I am, I'm starting to feel my way back into the play scene because I got COVID after getting vaccinated. So I'm like, well, at least for the next month or two, I have lots of antibodies. Not that I can't get something else, but like COVID wise, I'm less scared all of a sudden. So do you ever engage with people who have penises? So I was married to a cis man for 12 years and I would say stopped having sex together four years ago something like that and so since then no and it is an interesting situation because like him and I just didn't really have 
a great sexual relationship. So it is something that I've worked through, but no, for the most part, definitely hook up with mostly people who have vulvas. Okay. I literally was just asking because I got throat herpes from a person. I used to like deep throating people very much. I still think I would like it, but it's actually, I don't like it with a condom on it. Like it makes me gag in a way that just a cock didn't. (laughs) But I think I just need more practice too. And the number of penis partners that I found who are open to receiving deep throating with a condom so far, it's been one. And that was like only as a favor to me for an experiment. And the other ones so far like, so I'm like, all right, well, okay. So I need to find someone with herpes (laughs) to deep throat. Yeah, right. I guess that's the thing is when you are STI positive, like you're a lot more open to To certain things. Yeah. Okay. So now take us back to your early years. When do you first remember hearing about sex and what do you remember thinking and or feeling about it? So it is interesting. I was thinking about this pretty recently about my mother talking about pornography with my brother. I don't know what the context was, but I'm assuming she found him watching porn at some point. And the word that she used was animalistic. And she made a really big distinction between two married people or two long-term partners. It's funny because my parents actually weren't married until I was six years old. Oh, wow. Not a cultural thing. But two long-term partners making love being a really good thing, whereas like people in porn having really bad dirty sex so there's definitely that like moral duality of like yes you can have sex you should have sex but it should be within the context of long-term loving relationships and anything outside of that is kind of like degrading yourself or degrading other people and it is pretty interesting because I remember just like as I became more sexual always fighting with that notion of like I don't want to make love and knowing pretty early on like this isn't for me like a straight married relationship I don't want it like I knew I would say I started having this debate with my mother when I was probably eight years old of saying, I don't want to have children. Like I knew right off the bat, like I do not want to be a mom. And my mom was like, you can't hate kids. You are a kid. Like that doesn't make sense. But does that mean that you should want to have kids? Is that the assumption there? I guess so. So very early on, I was like, I know that marriage isn't for me. Motherhood is not for me. Like these single like heterosexual pairing just isn't for me and so then when it came to sex and my understanding of what my role was as a sexual person was really confused because I was like well on one hand I don't feel like what my mother has with my father makes sense for me like that's not my life I don't see myself in that I don't see myself being happy but also that message is like this is the only good way of having sex and then being like well I guess I'm just going to have to have bad sex, <laughs> like mm. quote unquote, unmoral sex and being like, fine, then I will be a slut, which is really interesting because being a slut when you're like 14, 15, you know, you're taking on like really, really big systems of oppression without having any kind of concept of what that means, what you're consciously doing. You know, like now at 28, I can realize and say like, yes proudly I am a slut I know what that means and I know the work involved with it but you know at 14 years old you don't like it's hard yeah wait so how old were you when your brother had that talk is it an older brother Uh, no so he's actually a younger brother he's two years younger than me and I was probably around 13 ish so he must have been like 11 12 something like that yeah wow okay so was that the closest you had to like a talk talk with your parents Yeah, I would say so. And it's funny. So I was put on birth control really, really young also, but it was never with the intention. Like my mother did not talk about it within the context of sex. There was still a lot of like pushback because I remember, you know, having multiple boyfriends in high school, especially Mm -hmm. later high school. So there was always a conversation of like sleepovers. And my parents were quite permissive in that way. But at the same time, very sex negative. It's such an interesting contradiction. And I know like talking to other people about this, it doesn't really make sense because I'm like, yeah, on one hand, my parents seem very like open minded and 
it was always like my partner's parents that were the ones that were like more conservative, more religious and more like hardcore. No, you can't sleep over. No, you can't do these things. My parents weren't like that. But at the same time, like their understanding of what was like appropriate still definitely clashed with the actions that I was doing. So it sounds like even as a young person, you had if I'm hearing correctly, a lot of interest and curiosity and desire for a sex life. Yeah. And I would say it wasn't even just like a desire for sex at first. It was a desire to understand like what was this bad thing. And like when I talk about like my brattiness being my personality, like this is not a new thing. This has definitely been my personality throughout when I found out like, oh, we is a bad thing I was like that I need it immediately (laughs) like give me all the drugs like I want to do the thing that I'm not supposed to I just kind of always had this instinct that if there's something that people don't want me to be doing it must be fun so there's always that like drive and that motivation to seek out like extra stimulation it sounds like you have a relationship where it's a container for you to be a brat outside of that. does Is that still true? Are you still like, ooh, a naughty thing, I must go try it? Or has that changed as you've gotten older? Yeah. No, no, I still do have that. I think as I've gotten older, I've also gotten like a fear of dying. So I don't do like sure. dumb bullshit, you know, like... <laughs> used to try to ride a motorcycle without a license without knowing how to ride a motorcycle like stupid shit when you're like a kid right that you do and you like I have no sense of what it like what the consequences of these actions are which now I have a lot more understanding so the desire is still there I don't necessarily act on it quite as impulsively as I used to (laughs) yeah and then what about sex ed in school because I moved around so much I had my first experience with sex ed being in public Japanese school. I didn't speak Japanese. I I think the closest they translated to me, this has shocked me and scarred me forever. They told me that like vaginal discharge was like silken tofu. So I expected at 10 years old that eventually tofu would be coming out of my vagina. Oh my God. And again, it's like problems in translation, I'm sure. Right. (laughs) trying to explain to you know a child something that they already don't understand cross language so that was a pretty big fear for me and then oh my gosh so I lived in Japan for middle school moved to Italy and was in Italy until like mid high school and then moved back to the U.S. so by the time I got back to the U.S. I had sex ed class as a senior as an 18 year old with freshman just as part of the state's requirements to allow me to graduate so I'd been having sex for four years by the time I had sex education and it was an AOM curriculum right in absence only until marriage so they were talking about how like you should not have sex and I remember just it made no sense to me and yeah like there was that really weird moment where I remember again pretty specifically the teacher trying to do a banana condom demonstration putting the condom on you know the wrong way and it not unrolling and just sitting there knowing like I can fix this for you but being like obviously this is not the time and place okay so you were already having sex can you walk us through first your personal exploration or whatever came first chronologically? Walk us through how you started exploring your body. Was it by yourself? Was it with a partner? Can you share those early, I was going to say early inklings. Can you share those early experiences with us? Yeah. So I think I started masturbating pretty young, like definitely sometime in elementary school. And it was very much just like dry humping, you know, mm-hmm. like the desire to just touch and again there was like no sexual context associated with it it was just like knowing oh wow my body feels good Mm -hmm. but there was also that shame thing of like don't do this in front of other people I don't know where that came from like I don't remember anybody telling me no but I do remember like okay this is not something that you do in front of other people Mm -hmm. And I remember there was actually another girl at my school who would masturbate at school not knowing what it was. And like that became a thing, right? Like my mother would call her the dirty girl. And so it's just like a situation where I think I was able to put both of those things together in my head of like, I don't want to be the dirty girl. Don't do that Mm. out in public kind of situation. And then when it came to living in Italy, I just remember like being in these very like quasi adult spaces 
So I went to like a private school there with a lot of kids that were pretty rich. And some of the parents would take us out to like clubs and things like that to go dancing. And I remember just like there being actual adult men. And at that point, I was probably like somewhere around 13 ish years old who were like just being really inappropriate. Oh. and recognizing for the first time like okay first of all I'm not safe in these situations but I'm safe because these people have bodyguards who are able to like contain these experiences and this is how you get attention whoa and you know obviously like we're talking about like really different sort of like socioeconomic situations like my dad obviously is like quite middle class but we were put in private school because of the work that he did with really, really rich kids. And I think there was kind of like a flippant attitude from those parents of like, we don't have time to take care of children. So there was always like other caretakers, if that makes sense. So they were like allowing us to do the things that we wanted to do. And again, like at 13, you're like, wow, I feel like so grown. And I recently looked at pictures of myself from that age and I was like, holy shit, I was an was actual child. child. Like, yeah. you know, you think you're so old and you're not. But I think that all of those early experiences just kind of like set me up to understand like, oh yeah, sex is something that I can use. Mm. And sex is something that does give me attention. So as I got into high school and, you know, started having those first experiences, a lot of the reasons why I was sleeping with men was because they had weed and drugs and all these things that I wanted. And I knew it was a really easy way to get attention. And again, moving around so much, it's hard to build relationships. Mm. Just being able to sort of like create those social bonds takes a lot of effort when you're moving so frequently. So being able to have sex with people was a much, much easier way of like exchanging intimacy exactly 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 so yeah there's definitely like a commodity exchange value which isn't something that I was able to like break free of until I came into my queerness and I think looking back now it makes a lot more sense because again back then I was very much in the closet and so all of the experiences of sex I was having wasn't because they were like personally pleasurable (laughs) there's always a different reason why and it's when I started sleeping with women and other AFAB folks that I was able to be like oh I see (laughs) like their sex can feel good just for sex like it doesn't have to fulfill any other kind of needs like you can just enjoy this for what it is (laughs) okay so in those experiences do you want to skip ahead to your queerness and how you explored that? Or are there any stories that were either great or terrible from your early explorations that are worth mentioning in specific? The only thing that is noteworthy is like I mentioned, my ex-husband and I met when we were 16 and started like dating together. But while we were dating, I had other sexual partners that I'd been sleeping with. So there's this always been for me, I think something pretty different in terms of how I've dated people has always been in a non-monogamous way. So we very much were doing like a don't ask, don't tell, but then we went long distance. And so while we maintain like that closeness, that intimacy and that relationship together, there were also really long stretches of time where we weren't together and we were sleeping with other people. And I think that sort of solidified like my understanding of yeah, sex does not have to be something that you share with just one human being. Yeah, But yeah, if you want to fast forward to me discovering my queerness, it's kind of like a multi prong Okay, yeah. Take us through the timeline and give us just enough context. So, okay. So yeah, when was it? How did it happen? And then give us the details. So I was 18, 19, probably went off to college back to Montreal. And that's when I met like the first outwardly queer folks in my life and started, you know, hooking up with my friends then. But both of us had boyfriends long distance. And so there was always this like very, oh, we're doing this, but it's just for fun. It's just casual. And I think for her, it very much was, you know, like it was not a thing. And I don't know where she's at in her life, but I don't think that she identifies as queer. It was very much like me falling 
my BFF kind of situation. Whoa, okay. And then I was sexually assaulted. I was raped during that time frame. So somewhere between like the spring semester and the summer. Mm. And so just like had this huge immediate shutdown of like my whole sexual self was just like, fuck, no, absolutely no. And there's like drugs involved in this. So it was like a hundred percent. So unconsensual. It was somebody that I knew and trusted and thought I was friends with. And so to be like Fuck. taken advantage of in such a like callous way, it fucked up like my entire understanding of like who I could trust, what it meant to be sexual, what it meant to be safe, all of it just like immediately shattered. And so with that sort of like went the queer exploration. I was just like, fuck no like no more none of it I was like okay I'm going to be like and this is obviously like a misunderstanding of asexuality but in my head at the time I was like I'm going to be asexual from now on Mm. (laughs) like this is the end of it for me luckily since I had such a wonderful partner my ex-husband he was able to slowly like bring me back out of that and it was through like sensory exploration I guess that we were able to sort of like rediscover some kind of intimacy and again there was like stretches of time where we weren't seeing each other because we were long distance so a lot of my healing was like having these little moments of sweetness when we would reconnect or when I did go live with him but it was always like two or three months at a time where we were able to be like okay this is what safety feels like this is what it's going to be like and just starting to sort of like open myself back up to those experiences and so it was later after living alone and apart for a while that I was like okay I can start dating again and so this is where like it became definitely more of cheating because at that point he didn't know that I was still seeing other people Uh I think his assumption was that we were like monogamous but long distance I don't know if he was seeing other folks because again like I said it was very much like we're not gonna ask each other (laughs) about this Wait, was it an explicit don't ask, don't tell, or did the don't ask, don't tell just happen? It's kind of always been a both. I think it's important to understand that, like, at that time, the word polyamory was not on our radar, was not, like, having a cultural moment. We're talking about, like, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So I don't think that that was something that we knew we could be. And it's only, like, about three years ago when we moved to Portland from New York that I started, like, actually dating somebody and was like all right we need to like formalize this and actually talk about it and create boundaries and create structure and actually be open about the fact that we're open and not just knowing that we're sort of open but not talking about it and so that became sort of like how how we moved into openness it's definitely been like a long ass process whoa i think when Finally, like we opened up after moving in is when like him and I just officially realized like, no, our sexual relationship does not work Mm -hmm. and it's not like healthy or helpful for me. So we really started just like sleeping exclusively with other people while we still live together. And that's when I was like, yeah, I don't have to sleep with men if I don't feel like it. Like that's not a requirement. Yeah, totally. So what is your relationship to queerness? It sounds like, or was there a moment where you felt like you claimed it, like it was yours? And just if that question doesn't make sense for a frame of reference, I was 25 and I was like, oh, I'm in love with her and him at the same time. That's possible? Wow. You know, even though I'd been playing mistletoe time with my three future husbands since I was in kindergarten, which is where I'd run around the playground and try to kiss them, you know, and they were all my three future husbands and I just didn't know. I never had like a traumatic, you can't be gay or you can't be queer. You can't like, I never had really a coming out moment. I just sort of was like, this is what it is now, you know? And so for me, it's always felt very like, am I even invited into the space or, you know, it's kind of, I just interact with it. Like I am here, but what's your, it sounds like you really had kind of like a journey of discovery. What does it feel like inside of you? Yeah. And it is really hard because again, like, I think for me, my experience of sex with men was so baggaged for lack of a better word like wasn't something that I was doing because I was in love with any of them and so I always had this understanding of like something does not feel right and from conversations with my mother like she used to often talk about my ex-husband being like oh he's just your friend 
And that's very much what we were. But at the same time, I felt so like, I don't know how to say this, insulted by yeah. those comments. So I was just like, fuck you, Nancy. What do you know about this? And I was like, how dare you say this? Like, that's not true. And at the same time, I was very much getting the message at home that there was like real lesbians or real gay people, yes, yes. that they looked a certain way. Yes. And again, I don't want to like drag everyone's fucking history into this, but my ex-husband's sister got married to a woman and my mother very much had that reaction of like, oh, she's not a real lesbian. She's just had bad experiences with men. And so a lot of my personal experience when I was 18, like I told you, was like both of those things at once where I was discovering my queerness. I was for the first time like, wow, I love this person and I know what it means to have sexual romantic feelings in a way I've never had for anybody else. And then right after like getting assaulted and being like, oh shit, fuck men. And then immediately it was programmed into my brain of like, oh wait, no, my mother is right. Like I'm gay because I was assaulted, which a hundred percent is not true, right? Like Mm -hmm. those two things do not work together, but I was so young. I didn't really like have the self-fortitude and confidence in myself and in my experiences to be able to recognize it her understanding of queerness as a cis straight woman has fucking nothing to do with queerness. So I think for me, it was only like when I moved to Portland and I saw like, oh my God, everyone here is out, is queer, is proud and is like so cool and chill with themselves. I was like, I want that too. And I think this is where it comes into the Colgate thing, like at work and being in such a like corporate environment those are not safe places to be Mm, out and proud. You know what I'm saying? I don't personally. I've never worked in a corporate environment and I've been self-employed since I was 24, 23, since I worked at a bar, you know? You're so lucky. (laughs) Kind of. It's definitely a grab bag, but like, tell us more about it for those of us who are like, I don't know. I mean, first of all, there was nobody that was queer at Colgate. And at the time, like my goal, you know, living in New York is really expensive. And my goal was to be on that track of like art director to creative director Mm -hmm. and I very much thought like okay if I just stay at this company for five years then I'm going to be promoted up the ranks and understanding like you have to fit a certain role right you have to look a certain way you have to have certain types of ideas you have to be normative you have to be able to talk to these clients that are like older straight white men and the more different you are, like the less successful you are going to be doing that. And so, you know, like I was on their corporate social responsibility team, like designing their pride ads and hearing all the homophobic bullshit that they were saying, things like, oh, make them look more cute or like make them look more normal. Like when we were presenting options for ideas of what it would like what queer people would be in the photography and there's a lot of that I mean the, the racism and the fucking homophobia of these corporations you cannot like overstate how bad it is and then going with you know I don't know you might have seen it but it's like now this rainbow uh, fucking nurdle is the word for it like the squirt of toothpaste on it wait what is the word a nerdle, I think, is just called. <laughs> That's such a good word. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because they didn't end up actually wanting to put people in those ads. Wow. But so it's like when you're hearing that type of sentiment, you're like, oh, yeah, cool. I am 100% not in the place to be exploring any of these feelings. Like, this is not something that I need to talk about. And so understanding, like, oh, yeah there's an asset to being straight passing. Like this has to very much be a conscious decision that I'm making. Like Mm. I have privilege based off of looking more normative. And it's only when I left and moved to a city that is quite a bit more like queer accepting that I realized like, yeah, actually I don't need to do that. Like my job should not hinge on me being a completely different person. I don't have to erase myself in order to be successful. As I hear you talk, I am, first of all, blown away because I know that corporate, I've heard these things. I know it in my knowledge brain, but I talk to so many fucking people that have all this kinky shit, all of these, like, you know, 
straight dudes who just like to get fucked in the ass once in a while or like we'll definitely suck a cock if the circumstances are right and it's like in secret and all of this stuff and i'm like are, are we gonna just like can we just like open the curtains and party together guys like uh, people in the world like let's just be lovers together so that's like one thought and then my other thought is like i have such the opposite like i am like i took off all my hair because my long blonde princess mermaid hair made people project this vibe onto me and then when i was weird they were like oh what you have a you have a strange personality you know and so try as i might i'm like no queer qu queer and horny wanna fuck everybody oh but now you okay okay you know and so finding the spaces to fit i think is it's just so interesting because your experience is so different in some ways and then we also have like a overlap in these other ways yeah. so what was your path going into sex education and this relationship that is for the time being at least monogamous and then I want to hear all the details of things you like. Pretty much what happened was when I left Colgate, moved cross country, was like, fuck this world, fuck all of this nonsense. I want to be a different person. Like, and I have to also like talk a, a little bit about the mental health piece of it is like, I got to a point where I was just like sick, having panic attacks. Like every time I would go into work, just like freaking out on the subway, like my chest was too tight. I felt like I couldn't breathe and just like, could not figure out what was wrong right i went to the doctor they're like you're fine like you're a healthy person like what's wrong with you like you're probably just anxious i realized like oh what's wrong with me is like i'm trying to pretend to be a person i'm not like that's that's what it is you know when your body is just like wake up like time to not do this anymore so move cross country and was like you know what honestly not having a job is better than having a job that I hate. It's better than pretending to be this person I've been pretending to be for like 25 years. I don't want this life anymore. And so I started freelancing because that's the only thing I knew how to do. I was like, I'm great at social media. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. good at drawing. And one of my first contracts was with a company in Australia that does like education around suicide prevention for oh, teenagers wow. cool. and through that contract I got in touch with a safer sex center at a university in Toronto and they hired me to do an erotic coloring book that focused on consent Fuck yeah. and I was like wait a minute what like this is the kind of work I could have been doing I've been spending my years you know, doing Myrtle advertising for Colgate, I could instead be like drawing kinky, queer people having sex in consensual ways. I was like, wow, my life priority is I need to reassess. <laughs> so through that work, you know, I started being like, oh yeah, people don't talk about consent. And that's when I had to revisit like a lot of the assault that I had experienced when I was 18 and just like process through all of that and realize like, I don't think that he's a bad person. Like, I hate this person so deeply. And I don't think he's a bad person. Like, I think he does not know that what he did was wrong. And I think that there's a lot of people who don't know what they're doing is wrong. And so I started doing a lot more like consent education graphics and all of that. And it was through me like processing a lot of this trauma and also going through my exploration of like, yeah, I get to be queer and I get to like draw about my journey of like identifying as like a closeted bisexual to like, no, I'm actually a lesbian and I want to be out and proud about it. Like this isn't something I have to continue hiding. And so through all of that, I just realized like, oh, I need to understand what and all of this means. Like this isn't something that I can just brush under the table anymore. And then as I started posting this, because again, this all started as a personal project, like mm -hmm. aside from the coloring book that I'd been commissioned yeah. to do. And notice like, wow, there's a lot of people who have exactly the same questions as me. Like, I'm obviously not the only closeted bisexual in a straight passing relationship. There's a ton of us and everybody needs like a space to be able to talk about these things and to learn what it means to have queer sex because a lot of us are confused, you know, mm. like we're approaching sex within our queer relationships through a heteronormative framework and lens and realizing like we get to change our understanding of what it means to be sexual right like afab folks are not told that they get to prioritize their pleasure and that was a like really big education that i had to do for myself and that i offered other people at the same time <laughs> 
Well, that is literally fucking beautiful. And I want to just circle back to something I heard you say, which it sounds like a lot of your healing journey was not only with your partner at the time and the touches that you would get in between the times when you actually get to see each other. But it sounds like this work, these jobs were like kind of a 2.0 of personal therapy for you. Was it? It sounds very creative, too. Yeah, absolutely. And it was very creative. You know, I was like pumping out content every single day. Again, like being unemployed and trying to like grind, (laughs) find a way to make an income. I was like, all right, like this is what people trust me with. And this is what I feel like I'm capable of doing. So I started doing just like a little education. And again, the bar is so fucking low. Like I need to just say that first is like when we were talking about those AOM curriculums, like we only heard about abstinence. So anything that's more than abstinence curriculums, I think is doing a better job. And I was like, yeah, we get to follow our pleasure. (laughs) Yeah. Following pleasure is huge. And I am developing a thesis that our creativity is definitely linked to our sexuality. And then in order Mm -hmm. for like the world to kind of function, I think people need to be in touch with their personal creativity, Mm -hmm. all sides of it, all aspects of it. And I know that that was a big part of like my own personal unlocking in all directions. And the other thing that I heard in your story is a level of compassion that I so rarely hear from people for the people who have harmed them. And I just want to like clarify that I agree with you. I don't think people are bad people. I think I am very much of the Marshall Rosenberg nonviolent communication school of thought that we are all human beings trying to get needs met. And based on the way that we were shaped, based on messages that we were taught, from our parents by example implicitly or explicitly like we're just trying to get needs met and most of us share a need for connection love and to be seen as we actually are and i just hear so many themes of that in your story and so i think it's so beautiful that you're like now amplifying that out into the world how did that affect your sex life what is it like now what have you explored since you got in touch with your kinky bits and how did you get in touch with your kinky bits i can break those down and re-ask any of them start wherever you will Uh uh-huh I will just say one note about the offender part of it is like, I don't have compassion for my personal offender. I want to like I have it in theory, I do Mm -hmm. not have it in practice. And I think it's so vastly important to be able to continue to do a lot of this hard work. Like that's why I talk to self identified offenders and explain to them what it means to be able to, you know, have consent and to practice that with their partners and all that. Cause so many people just don't understand that like consent is not a bad thing. We're not putting up blocks, (laughs) right? We're setting up gameplay, right? We're giving rules so that everybody can be safe to engage in these games or to participate in these experiences together. And so many people have never been told that that's a precursor, (laughs) that you have to be able to respect other people's ability to say yes and ability to say no. I think the more that I gave myself permission to say that, and through a lot of this work, I was talking to other like sexual violence victims, survivors, but also offenders and realizing like, no, this seems to be like education we all kind of need to do. And especially when it comes to kink, like there are safety concerns, like you do have to know what you're doing and you have to be able to talk to people. Because again, you can't just start like whacking somebody and assume that that's going to feel good to them if you never ask them what that threshold is. Mm-hmm. I think for me, it was like realizing like, yes, if I'm able to give myself permission to say, yes, I deserve to have safety in my sexual interactions, then I feel safer to try more and more and more and more things. And I feel like I'm able to tell my partners like, yes, this works for me. (laughs) No, this doesn't work for me. And it just opened me up to a lot more experiences that I don't think I would have had before. And being able to say like, I can engage in experiences that I'm not sure I'm going to enjoy but I can still do that safely like I think about this hookup where somebody just like bit me all over Mm -hmm. (laughs) and left like really intense bruises and it's like okay realize maybe that's not for me necessarily (laughs) okay wait yeah yeah rewind and tell us how you got into it this is the most detail we've gotten so far and we love details here so set the frame for us so you were with a partner that was explicitly kinky or it was like they just started biting you and you in the moment went with it and we're like, I'll see how this goes. So this was a hookup. I didn't know this person at all. Messaged them on Tinder and then, I don't know, they were like leaving for a while. And so I 
drove up to Seattle, which is like two hours away and was like, hi, let's hook up today. <laughs> like, And we did. And yeah, this person apparently was like super, super into biting, which I obviously like other partners had bit me, but not like exclusively like that hadn't been like their shit. And apparently that was with this person. Yeah. And it's not something that I knew like people really got off on. Mm-hmm. I think I'm only so so about it also. So as it was happening, were you like, is this too much or I'm good with it? Like, what was your thought process in the moment? Do you remember? Or your feelings? So I think as it was happening, you know how like just all those happy feelings get flooded and like pain tolerance was increasing, increasing, increasing. And so I just didn't feel like the hurt of it. It was definitely like, ah, pleasure bites. And it was after the fact that I was like, oh, I don't think I like being marked <laughs> like this. Okay. So it's about figuring out marks. That's a, it's definitely like a specific sensation. I don't know. Are you into biting? <laughs> I'm very into biting and the context is very important. So like my master is allowed to bite me and he'll bite my earlobes so hard and he's left hickeys on my chin or like, you know, bruise marks there. But the question of do you like biting versus are you okay with marks being left on your body? Those are two very different questions. Very different. And so if some rando that I was hooking up with at a sex party or a club or whatever, like just started chomping on me super hard, I would pull away and I would be like, let's have a conversation, you know, but also probably the reason I get rejected so much is that I actually try to have those conversations ahead of time. And so what I'm noticing in the current hookup culture, like I was at a sex party two weeks ago, like the first one, me like going by myself to see how it would be. And first of all, nobody had sex at the sex party. And there was a guy there who we kissed because spin the bottle. I had kissed a couple of people. And there was a point where I, no one was fucking. So I got naked and got in the pool and he got in and kind of was following me around. And I was like open to things, but I need someone to like make an effort. And I also just know that if someone's just going to like hang around, usually they want me to do all the work and I'm a kinky submissive. And so my, the promise, the goal that I'd set for myself that night was like, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to see how it is. I'm going to practice my human social skills And I'm not going to be so impatient that I end up leading because that's kind of the number one thing. Like people are sort of always waiting for me to create experiences for them or entertain them. And I will because I'm so horny, but like I'm exhausted right now. (laughs) I'm exhausted. And so and I've gotten increasing, you know, asks from semi stranger people or people who know me here. And so I'm like, I'm tired. I'm just going to see what happens. So when this man put his hand on my thigh and I was like, I love touches and I require very explicit communication. He just got up out of the pool and left (laughs) and didn't try to fuck me and didn't try to be like, well, what does that mean? And didn't try to be like, I'd like to have sex with you. Like anything. I would have done anything if he'd been like, will you give me a blowjob? I'd have been like, yes, but he little boys can't use their words when they're in their 60s even apparently. And so it's like, okay, well, what am I supposed to do? And so I think that that's why I get rejected so much. And like, I'm very open to exploring and getting bitten all over and all of that too. And I'm super resilient. And like, I don't mind marks or bruises, but at the same time, it's like, I like to know if they're happening because random people get different privileges, you know? And if anyone I'm with just like tries to go for my throat, I'm like, hold on. Do you know how dangerous that is? And if they're like, oh, it's just a little choking, then I'm like, okay, well, you don't get that toy. Like, you are you don't know. So what if you give us some details about things that you've discovered that you love? That I love. Well, tell us, tell us about how did you discover your kinky brat self? You know, I think it comes from like, especially my current partner is what I call like an untoppable top. Like I try to top her and she just will not let me. What's that like? She just like has a very self-assured way of existing in the world. And she's like... I strap you like I am the giver in this situation. Like I know what you want kind of thing, which I love. Like, don't get me wrong. I think I verge on that like pillow princess side of things to like a brat. So either I'm just like, yes, let me be greedy. I want everything that you're going to do to me. But often I'm just like, more and harder <laughs> which I know is like not the greatest way to be because like, Why? I get that that's exhausting dude like that's hard dude. That's- a lot of people love giving more and harder I'm just saying I don't know I don't really understand the binary words like good bad especially when they're pointed at yourself I don't understand them usually or and so I always ask for clarification because I think it sounds fucking fantastic in the most literal way <laughs> So when I feel like I'm asking too much, that's when I like 
turning on my brat side and I love playing the game. So my partner is a personal trainer and just like a hell of a lot more muscular than I am. Amazing. So sometimes I love just being like, I am your top. Just insist on it and try to like get on top of her, like physically wrestle her down, knowing I have zero chance in the world of doing that. <laughs> so that's my favorite. I also like squirming away and just like the game of like trying to get off. Like I like that kind of hunting game is really fun. It, pretty much anything that like plays into this, like you have to catch or like someone is not behaving in the role that they were meant to be. Mm. I think is what really appeals to me. And I think with her, you know, being a more like vanilla person, it's really been like that challenge of giving each other permission. Like I think, especially in the beginning, I just felt so intimidated about having a partner that was both going to be like my nesting partner and my sexual partner because in my life most of the time it, things have been separate so I've always given myself more permission like with this stranger I was telling you about it's like yeah if things go weird if it gets too hard if I have to you know like safe word out of something it doesn't feel like the stakes are very high because I don't expect them to hold me to any kind of standard or expectation like there's not a relationship at stake okay. but trying to do that with my partners I find it to be like pretty intimidating for me where I'm just like oh no am I going to ask for something that's going to make you see me in a weird light uh -huh. and is that going to like translate this fun dynamic how is that going to impact like our real world relationship dynamic? And so I think that's definitely been like the growing I've had to do over the past like a year and a half of being like, okay, well, if she is my only sexual partner, I need to be able to talk about my needs and I need to be okay with the fact that like she might not be into something and that needs to be okay. And that needs to not threaten our relationship dynamic. Yeah. Well, first of all, I want to offer perhaps it already is okay, and perhaps there's discomfort to discover in the future. But when I hear you speak, I think so much about last week's episode, Wyndham, because he said something so similar, which is this, what you just said about the idea of like, can I really share everything with this person? And I guess since my sexual awakening, you know, I'm pretty anchored to my master, but he's in a don't ask, don't tell with a wife. And so my anchor partner is never going to be a nesting partner. And he's much older than I am. But I still feel when I hear the thread of similarity is like the willingness to go out and explore with people. But I heard you say that you feel like your hookup partners don't hold you to a higher standard or something where it's like you're less afraid of being judged was kind of the vibe I got from your words. Do you hold them to a standard different from your partners? I guess the standard that I'm saying is like the longevity of it, right? Like we don't have expectations of each other outside of this like sex situation, this yeah. sexual relationship. And I think that's where I give myself permission. And again, this is probably just like my own like relationship fears and shit to deal mm -hmm. with. Yeah, but it can, it's so connected to the sex life, right? Like how do you separate them? I think for me, again, just like, I think there's like a real fear of my nesting partner being out of equilibrium with me. We can be more vanilla. Yes, we don't have to have sex quite as often okay. or whatever it is. And that's why I've always had other partners. <laughs> like, it's not that I hold my sexual partners to no standard. That's not it. It's more just like the only standard that I'm holding you to is a sexual one. Okay, I'm having kind of a semi-real-time epiphany that might sound very stupid when I say this out loud, but am I understanding correctly? Is it normal, air quotes, is it normal for people to prioritize some sort of connection separately from their sexual selves? Because I don't think I'm able to do that, and I wonder if that's why I'm scaring people on Tinder away or Field or wherever I'm swiping. Like, do people do that? Why do people do that? I hear so many stories where people are like, but then I couldn't tell them about myself, especially sexually. And then it's over. And then I'm like, well, how did it start without your sexual self? Yeah. And I think this is where, like, for me, at least, it's a balance of like that individuality and togetherness that becomes really tricky. Right. I think in order for me to be my most like liberated and happy sexual self, I really have to ramp up my individuality. 
And for me, when I have to balance like another person's needs, Mm -hmm. especially like for the relationship, when the togetherness takes precedence over the individuality, that's when I tend to clam up and default to what my partner wants rather than what I want. And again, it's not to say that in sexual interactions, like casual sex, I'm only being like, oh, you have to do this for me. Obviously not. Like that is still a trade-off. And it's just like the initial comfort of like, do I feel like I am able to value my individuality enough to ask for what I want, even if it risks the togetherness. And when there's no togetherness to be able to risk, then it's like, of course, you just say the thing. And I think for me, yeah, like that's been a really big unlearning. I have to say that I think what I've learned this past year is like the trust does help right? Like there is something lovely about being super sexy. Yeah. Tell your partner like, oh, I know you well and I know what you want. And now I'm able to give you what you want because we've rehearsed it really often. So I think that is like the other really lovely part that I'm having to like get more into is like, oh yeah, I am a sexual relationship person. I just need to believe in that about myself. Totally, totally. (laughs) Well, also as I hear you talk, I'm like, oh yeah, my the things that are closest to relationships in my world have come sex first. And then it's like, wow, we have so much in common. I love you. How great. You know, and so I'm like, other people don't they do it a different way. Don't they want to fuck more? Um, And what I'm learning is like sex is not the top priority for most people. How do you like to touch yourself? What does your vulva love? First of all, a lot of lube is the thing that I've discovered is like, yes, high quality lube. Love like a good infused like CBD or THC lube. I think that's definitely my go-to. Other than that, you know, I've been using a lot more toys recently, realizing like I like that really like consistent stimulation and like hard stimulation, Mm -hmm. which isn't something that like, my partners are necessarily able to do or that my hand is able to do either. So just giving myself permission to be like, oh yeah, that can totally become like a more central part of like my masturbation habits. So like specifically those like clit stim toys are really fun. Yeah, I started to masturbate in a lot more like erotic pain kind of way. So like even just like spanking myself or like smacking my thighs and that kind of stuff is something that I've started to do. Like using nipple clamps while I'm masturbating so that there is always like that little like pain point for me is really important. I think they're called Wartenberg wheels. Do you know these wheel things? Spiky wheels, for sure. Those pinwheels, like something I absolutely love. And especially like around my genitals. You do it yourself? It's something that I expected. Yeah, definitely. And like push it in. How about electro play? I got a spiky wheel with electro in it for the first time and it was wild. I have not tried that. Are you talking about like the violet wand? Like attachment. Yeah. Fun. Yeah, that would definitely be something I'm into. No, definitely like giving myself permission to be like this is not self-harm if it feels good i'm like oh yeah you can hurt yourself but in a deliberate and intentional way too yeah yeah and there's like big hurt yourself and like little pain pleasure hurt yourself because the dopamine pathway is like very related to both pain and pleasure are you more of an inside outside person it sounds like there is perhaps a mixture i thought i was an only outside person person and I think a lot of that was just like following my assault like just not being able to have any kind of penetrative sex I really really like penetration I'm super fucking triggered by penises and any kind of like anatomical anything so it has to be like a non-anatomical dildo or fingers or something like that and it's a completely different experience like I used to get such incredible like tightness they call it like vulva I think is is it different from vaginismus different okay yeah a clenching okay a muscle clenching situation so it used to be really like intolerable not something that was enjoyable and it's only recently that I've realized like oh yeah I actually really enjoy like deep penetration like far in penetration did not know this about myself yeah so do you have a tentacle dildo I do have a tentacle dildo. <gasps> I want to get one so bad. What, do you have any other cool shapes? Like a rocket ship or something? I want to get a rocket ship. I assume those exist. No, I don't have a rocket ship. I do have one that, that's like a unicorn horn, which is really fun. And it comes on this like cool handle <sighs> situation. The company is Silk Arts. Cool. Okay, I'm going to check it out. Do you know the brand like Cute Little Fuckers? No. 
oh they're really fun so they do a bunch of like monster themed non-anatomical toys so they sent like this little starfishy grindy thing and they have like this monster shaped dildo it looks like a little ghost with all these things coming out of it so yeah amazing can you tell us some details about how you like to pleasure partners bodies my partner like i said an untoppable top somebody who has not ever given herself permission i would say or who hasn't had partners who have been willing to like touch her or go down on her or anything like that so just like learning that together has been a really big like trust building exercise I would say learn that she had never like come through oral sex before it took us like quite a while to even get to the place where she was comfortable letting me go down on her for me as much as I say like I'm pretending to be a top and I love like acting like I'm a top I think in other relationships, there's not like that hesitation. But in this relationship specifically, I'm very like cautious of respecting her limits and not like pushing her too far. And I think it inhibits me a little bit, you know, like especially in the beginning, I was just really nervous about like, is this too far? Like, is this going to be something that is triggering for her or something that she's not going to want? And so there's like a lot of me holding myself back. Mm -hmm. And so now when I'm like touching her, it's a lot of like that internal battle of like, of course it's okay. And like, you can trust her to tell you if it's gone too far, you don't have to be so like tentative and you don't Mm -hmm. have to be so careful. I will share with you the one time I did strap was in a dead pastor's bed and it was not a good time for me. I was so fucking embarrassed. I was like, I cannot be doing this. Also, there's 10 like pictures of Jesus all around and I feel wildly, wildly uncomfortable. (laughs) Oh my God. Was that the reason you chose to strap for the first time? Were you like, blasphemy? Like, is that your brat streak coming out or was it just happenstance? Yes. So I definitely have like a little nun fetish situation happening. I don't know where it comes from. I just like, if we can dress up like nuns, I keep on telling her like, this is what's going to happen. Like, this is our next level of our relationship. I get to live out my dream. But then turns out it was not actually a dream because I'm so bad at this. Mm strapping i don't know it takes a whole lot more coordination than i and i was just like ah i've always been the bottom like i don't need to worry about this are you bad at it if you've only done it once though yeah i'm gonna have to like work up the nerve to do this again but i just felt like i was just being like watched by god (laughs) can you tell us what your biggest turn-ons and or turn-offs are I really like water, like anything related to pool sex, hot tub sex, shower sex. Like I want it all the time somewhere in a body of water. I just really like the way it feels. So I would say that would probably be a really big turn on. Like if I could be a mermaid immediately, that would be my choice. Like I don't know what the downstairs situation is for mermaids, but in my kinky dream, you know, we're like mermaid nuns or something like that. I don't know. (laughs) Oh my God. Amazing. I love that. My turn off is anal sex. I really do not like that for okay. whatever reason. Like I've tried, 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 tried. Cannot figure out how to make it pleasurable for mm-hmm. myself. Like immediately, I just have that like <gasps> learn that that is not for not me. Real. Okay, okay. I've been trying to be more okay with other people's buttholes because fine. Like if that's your thing, great. But so far, I'm still a little tentative. So I have a butthole thing. <laughs> okay, okay. Are you into sexting? I am very much into sex sync. And again, this is another thing where I've like had to learn, oh, there are like digital safety things that you need to take into concern. <laughs> really, really early on, I had my nudes leaked at like 15 years old and was like, ah, that's not great. Just like having to learn like Snapchat is probably your best option for this. Like something where like it's going to disappear, like it's not going to be stored on somebody's phone forever. Well, here's a question for you today. Are you body conscious in that way? So I started posting nudes of myself everywhere. I'm naked everywhere and sharing them effusively because I'm like, I have a lot of nudes out there. I don't want those to leak. What's the best way to prevent a leak? Make it so that the leaks don't fucking matter. Like that's kind of, you know, and also I am very naked and really don't care. For you, what was the result as a 15 year old? Like what happened? I got slut shamed so bad at school as a result. There was no like legal repercussions or anything like that, but it was just like yeah, that. but emotional. Exactly. And 
especially being slut shamed by other girls and being like, oh, like there are serious consequences for this in terms of like being ostracized by other mm. people. Today, I know there's nudes of me like floating around out there and I don't think I have that same level of like, <clears throat> I'm scared of it personally. Are you into porn? If so, what kind? I am. So I want to talk about like ethical porn and how important it is. I do really like girl on girl porn. I like companies that are like paying their fucking actors and actresses better. I think like that should be a standard. Fuck yeah. Having a hard time like figuring out who and what. So it's been like kind of a debate in my head of like, where is the right place to go? And again, I was going to immediately be like, oh yeah, OnlyFans has been fantastic and you can pay your creators directly. And now like as of this week and last week, I'm just like, Fuck OnlyFans. Yeah, yeah. I moved all of my nudes off of OnlyFans to my own website because I was like, oh, and now you're going to say that you put creators first? No. No, you don't. But OnlyFans, I think, did a great thing. So it makes it so now we are trained to look for creators to pay them directly. And I think that that overall means that we're moving in the right direction, even though their whole story about the banking system. I'm like, all right, well, you guys, wow, wow, it sure was easy to fix that in a week. Wow. As it stands, I don't know where to, who to endorse. Or yeah, what. yeah. I like my own homemade porn the best. Because I went to film school, because I am a filmmaker, because that's like my medium, most porn has always put me into like production mode. So it's like hasn't been fun for me with very few exceptions of circumstances where I was like ordered to watch a certain thing at a certain time, you know, and it was one of the kink productions. And I don't, I don't know the details of their thing because I don't know who it was or what it was. <laughs> okay, so group sex sex parties sex clubs swingers parties like where do you fall on those scales i've always fallen on the no for no particular reason and now i'm falling on the actually probably maybe as a result of my newly monogamous relationship wait what (laughs) so in the past it's always been like ah well i get free range on who i date and i'm fine with all of this like Uh i really enjoy casual dating like i think that's my favorite Now with my partner, though, I think based on her sexual boundaries, any kind of like experience that we're going to have will have to be much more like contained than what I'm normally used to, where casual dating might not work quite as well. And so we've been talking a lot more about like group sex and that becoming a thing that we participate in kind of as a middle ground as a way for both of us to get what we're looking for. And at least to just like introduce what non-monogamy would look like in our relationship. So I'm definitely having to reconsider all of it. For a while, there was like this thing because I said something dumb on a podcast once. I was like, yeah, fuck threesomes. Like you never have good threesomes. So I was branded as like- people say that though i will go back and retract that statement and be like i'm a tentative on three okay okay but also like god can we please live in a world where people are allowed to explore and grow and like not get attacked i'm like isn't that the world we're trying to create together it's the world i'm trying to create okay do you have any sexual fantasies that have not yet come to pass but that you hope will yeah i mean honestly like i think I could see myself getting into like a nice group of hot butches degrading me. I think I would (laughs) be into that, but haven't yet. And I think maybe that's my 2022 resolution. I love that. What are your sexual hopes for yourself going forward? I think my sexual hopes is that I'm going to continue putting less pressure on myself. Even as an educator, I think it's really easy for me to talk about theory, talk about like the nice consent part of it to a point where I no longer feel like that joy thing that we were talking about earlier, right? Like it's hard sometimes to be like, oh yeah, if you're having all the STI conversations, if you're negotiating scenes, things tend to feel like a lot heavier and a lot more restrictive for me anyways. I was going to say, I don't actually share that experience. And I think it's important to note that we have different experiences there. And so maybe I will need to ask you how you view this. Because again, like for me, it's important to be able to have all of those conversations to set out those rules. But sometimes I really do just want to go a little bit more with the flow and not feel like I'm having to educate through these experiences. Yeah. At the very beginning of this conversation, like when I tell people, hey, I'm a sex educator, 
it's nice because then they're not like shocked when I'm asking them about their safer sex practices. But there does tend to be this like expectation that I'm going to know everything or that I'm going to, you know, have these really high expectations. And sometimes I just want to have shitty, dirty, weird sex. You know, <laughs> like, Absolutely. What makes you feel the most desired or appreciated sexually? Mm. I will say when I am topping, I need a lot of like feedback and reassurance, which is the current thing that I'm struggling with my partner. Like I want somebody who is as enthusiastic of a bottom as I am an enthusiast. Absolutely. So I would say that that's the big key for me and a little bit of the reason why I feel tentative currently <laughs> topping. Oh, I can relate. But yeah, like somebody who's able to, yeah, be pretty like greedy in their desires. I think that's what I find really hot. I'm trying to bring that energy and at least like give my partners that level of feedback when I do like things. I also really like somebody and this is the thing that she does do really well is like is so fucking honest. I never have a question in my mind of like where I stand with her. Beautiful would add like clarity as being my new benchmark and it's not something that I necessarily knew that I wanted because I don't know that I'm like the most direct person and so having somebody who's like very direct I'm like oh my god that's so hot like I really appreciate you just being able to cut all this bullshit and get right to you know what you mean and what you say (laughs) oh my god that is a woman after my own heart I agree with Brene Brown clear is kind I am such a big believer in and a fan of clarity because what is the point if you actually know and it leaves space for not knowing it doesn't mean you have to know everything all the time but I fucking love that if you could go back in time and give younger you a piece of sex advice what age or ages would you pick and what would you say I would go right to that 18 year old self and be like yeah, go queer. It's fine. (laughs) Like you don't need to spend all these years like battling yourself about whether or not this is going to be socially acceptable. Like end of the day, it doesn't make sense to just try to be somebody else. Like do the people that you want to do, I guess would be my, would be my advice. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Okay. Do you have a sex question for me? Yes, I do. Tell me why you feel like, yeah, having scripts or being able to talk about sex actually makes you feel like you have freer sex. Well, first, I do want to say I'm not foolproof at making those conversations happen in any way, shape or form. I stumble through since the podcast started. I get rejected more than ever. I find it very difficult to be a kinky submissive who's like, I'm a kinky submissive. I love tops who lead and who can clearly lead negotiations. And Since starting the podcast, I haven't met a new one of those. It's been almost three years. And I've been looking. I've been looking. Not super hard. It's not my top priority. But when I can meet someone, when I do meet someone who has clarity, and oftentimes now the new partners that I've engaged with, there's a level of me sort of facilitating these conversations and trying to get them to a place where they lead. But it's it's that same thing that you were talking about. I'm not a sex educator. I don't identify as a sex educator. But because people are like, well, you have a sex podcast, like you are in charge. And so I find myself driving it all the time. And that is a bummer and that is a turnoff for me. And what is much better for me is if ahead of time, or if I have to drive it, if ahead of time I can know what's on the table and what's off the table, if I can know that they know like these clear frameworks, then I am able to relax and let go of my anxiety and actually be present with them, their body, me, my body, whoever else we may be with, and know that we at least are starting on the same page in as much as two human beings who are trying to like communicate all these thoughts and feelings inside our human bodies can use these weird words to like relate to each other. Like we're doing our best. And I actually think that there are many, many ways. I'm very impatient, but if I force myself to do something like go on a date where we have dinner or a picnic or a walk and we turn the talking about things ahead of time into fantasy to like, well, what would you want to do to me? Then it just becomes a long turn on. And then when you start to get there, it doesn't mean that you're going to like now just like run through the motions of the things that you've outlined, but it's like you kind of have a good sense for where that person is. And because I, like you, I don't try to top people, but I am often put in the position where basically it feels like any vanilla sex now that I'm having, it feels like I'm being asked to lead without ever having the clarity of the partner that they are asking me to lead. You know, so a new vanilla lover recently, I'm like, what do you want now? Like, I've come three times. What do you want? And they're like, 
uh, whatever you want. And I'm like, oh, again? Oh, you still don't have a new answer? Oh, you want, you want me to choose every single time. For me, that's super duper boring. And so I think that if I have spoken with someone ahead of time at length, I think it gives them permission to exercise their creativity and builds that trust that then it does kind of what you create where they're like, oh, at least my partner will definitely tell me if they want something different. Most of the time with people who are scared, I think they're usually just scared of communication. Those people are usually the ones that like I'm checking in with them as I go and they're like, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. And then afterwards, like I didn't like that. And it's like, you know, it's a problematic thing because obviously we can only be so aware of our nervous systems in real time so much. And and I tend to be a person that like, as I reflect on the 32 years of life that I've had, I have very, very, very little error when it comes to like, here's how I feel in the moment versus here's how I feel later. Like I know in real time kind of how I'm feeling and I can express it pretty easily. Like that's my, that's my gift. And so for me, I think learning, learning that other people's experiences are not the case, that makes me all the more inspired to want those conversations ahead of time. As much as I like casual sex, as much as I like stumbling curiously into things. So yeah, it's definitely bumpy though. <laughs> Where can people find you on the internet? People can find me at shrimpteeth.com. Same thing for Instagram, at shrimpteeth. And our new podcast, which is Queer Pleasures by Shrimp Teeth. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Awesome. Sam, thank you so much for being a guest. Thank you so much for having me. Lovers, that is our show and the Sex Story Season 2 finale. Please go subscribe and listen to Sex at Work right now, right now, right now. Go do it. Please, please, please. Now, now, now. I am really working to find brands who are allies for Mission 69, the sex stories road trip mobile dungeon playship journey that I would like to launch next year, but I can only do it with your help. So go subscribe right now. If you'd like to apply to be a guest for season three of Sex Stories, especially if you haven't heard a guest like yourself lately, visit sexstoriespodcast.com. And you can also submit a sex at work story there, either through email or a voice memo. If you'd like to support Sex Stories on our mission of encouraging personal creativity, if you want ideas about questions to ask your lovers or hear more of my personal stories or details, including my secret kink that I do not talk about here on Sex Stories, or if you want to go see my self-portraits, visit yole.com slash lovers. Subscribe to Sex Stories wherever you get your podcasts and be a lover who makes the world a more loving place by leaving Sex Stories five stars and an honestly enthusiastic review wherever you can and subscribe and give a thumbs up on YouTube. Instagram is at Sex Stories Pod and I am at Yole. Sex Stories is created by me, Yole, with editing by the great and wonderful Kimberly Loftus. Lovers, please dare to be curious, both about yourself and your lovers. Take care of yourselves, take care of each other, and remember to share sex stories. <laughs>